I am extremely honored to have won this prize. It's very meaningful to me. Just tell you a quick story. I started out as a chemist, and I did my PhD in pharmacology with David Cook, who had just gotten his PhD at Oxford with Bill Payton. So I was classically trained. And the first thing David said to me was, go into the library and read for a month. Don't do anything else. So I read Arians, Van Rossum, Schild, Rang, Cahoon, um, Gadam, Gadam, Gadam. And it really shaped the way I thought thereafter. So all of what you'll hear really has been shaped by this uh, education. And it, it re really is meaningful to me that um, I'm giving this lecture. It's about receptors, which as we all, all know, have gone through various iterations. They were, uh, there's golden ages and, and dark ages, and so subtypes, golden age, we ran out of them. Uh, we had new assays to give us new eyes to see. Genomics sort of dampened studying whole systems, but I'd like to suggest that bias and Alice theory is giving new ways to approach old targets, so consider it a new shot on goal. When I was a student and receptors were thought to be more like switches, so eff efficacy could change o only in strength. Not much quality, but, but strength. So we have quotations like this, our models, where all switches join together, making the energies all right and so forth. About 1992, I got, uh, I changed my views, and I'll explain who did that, with this idea that proteins move. So we have dynamics now, and that's a whole new way to think of things, and so that's what I will try to uh, explain changed our work over the years. I did my work in industry, and so pharmacology to us was the chemical control of physiology. We were af after drugs. Um, and one of the worst enemies, enemies to us was system dependence. Anyone could run a curve, get an IC50, and say that's how active this compound was in this assay. We, what we had to do, though, was say, will it be active in some other assay in therapeutics that we are not looking at? So the whole idea was to evolve scales, efficacy, where we could build these scales and predict in all systems. Uh, so two of those scales we all know very well. What makes a drug a drug? It binds to the target, so it, it has to have a affinity, and the Big one for us, pharmacology is really, really talks a lot about this idea of efficacy. What does it do when it gets there? And efficacy has been an evolving concept um, over the years, and it still is. It really has changed again from way back when I was a student. Now we know it can be negative, it's vectorial. Uh, Michel Bouvier, Corn coined this term, drugs can have many efficacies. It's pluridimensional. What I'll tell you about today is efficacy can be pathway selective, that's good, therapeutically, but it can also lead to system dependence, that's not so good for us. But it's all this idea about biased efficacy. So efficacy was given to us as a concept, Stevenson, it was quite simplistic back then. You had an assay, any compound that caused Stevenson's guinea pig ileum to twitch had efficacy, and those that did not, did not have efficacy. And it was a very powerful idea. And implicit in that idea was if you had a cell good enough, if you had a sensitive enough cell, then it, it will reflect everything that that receptor could do. Given that, 
um, you could then say, well, all I need is a good assay, a good, robust assay. I can do my screening on it. I can do everything because it's telling me everything that happens. And this has been a general rule of thumb for years. It also generated one of the most powerful tools we have in drug discovery, the potency ratio. So there I am there hearing this. This was the rule that if you could get a ratio, this would um, go across all systems and it could be predictive. Very important because we're rarely here, we're over here. So we had to bridge that gap. And so potency ratios were one way to do this. Potency ratios depend on this assumption, however, that what links what happens at the receptor to what we see is monotonic. There's one Y for every X. If this is not the case, then these rules don't hold. And so that's what I'll talk about. Uh, we will revisit this where systems where that is not true and we're seeing breakdowns in this potency ratio idea. Um, so I, sh I show this for two reasons. Uh, Peyton was a great man and I did my PhD in Ilium, but the point of this screen is uh, back then we were using a limited number of assays. Uh, guinea pig Ilium, rat atria, rabbit aorta, so we all got the same answers. It was a very tight world and uh, everything seemed to hold up. As soon as we could break beyond that, and so as soon as we could express receptors in different hosts, give it different things to interact with, uh, we started to see just how complex things are. And so this, this was about the 80s, and you started to see articles come out here and there that said, nah, thing, things aren't quite as ordered as we thought. This was an early article, Brian Roth um, point, pointed out way back then in 87, said maybe, maybe we can get ligands to talk to just one system and not have to talk to all of them. So these ideas were being talked about. For our part, we became interested because you started to get assays. The whole key here was before Stevenson had his ilium twitching or guinea pig ilium twitching, now we had assays to see different parts of what the receptor could do. We also realized that receptors could interact with more than one thing. For example, GI, GO, GS, GQ. And so as pointed out by Jim Black, that really what we call efficacy is what our assay is telling us. We design an assay and what we see we think is efficacy. And as you have different assays, you will have different efficacies. So we asked a question in 1989 I worked with Paul Morgan, who had a computer and knew how, how to use it. What if the receptor formed different states? This was still in the realm of what if. We were just fooling around. Uh, what would happen as it encountered different interactants? And so, obviously, this, this is easy to see. You would get different uh, activities, different potency ratios. But shortly thereafter, what if became what is. <clears throat> you started to see data like this. Now this, to me, was the one that was really important. Spengler's group had PACAP receptors, um, pieces of PACAP, and they could get two functional readouts, IP3 cyclic AMP, from this system. <clears throat> And what they showed was the linear efficacy uh, world of Stevenson, what that system simply could not do. It can't. And it was you had a reversal of relative potency of these agents depending on what readout you were looking at. There, there was no way to, to explain this bef before then. 
It also meant that potency ratios were not um, in violet. This, this was terribly upsetting to a classically trained pharmacologist such as I. There I am there. I, I was ter terribly upset because it meant the receptor wasn't the minimal unit of control, but rather what the ligand made of it, the active state. Ligand comes in there, it makes a different state, and that becomes the controlling unit. So we went from this idea that the receptor is the main key to what ligand A makes of it. And it can make different states and so forth. 17 years after this was proposed in theory, Ray Stevens actually sees these. He can use NMR and he can actually see how different ligands make diff different states. So that's, that's the working idea we, we have now. We weren't the only ones doing this, of course. There were many groups. Uh, we called it trafficking. It's a name that never caught on. No one liked it. Uh, Matthew Yarpe was the first to call this bias. I'd like to also point out Richard Mailman <clears throat> did some pioneering work here. So there were a lot of groups seeing this, seeing how ratios changed, seeing how you could get ligands uh, activating pathways in complex ways. And one of the things that came out of this wasn't so good. We lose this nice prediction. We get this ratio in our system. Will it be therapeutic? And that's because we've lost this idea that it's monotonic. Ligand 1's using that curve. Ligand 2 is using the other curve. So there's no way to say that these ratios we see are actually the ratios that are happening at the receptor. I'll talk about that in a more positive way. Right now it's negative. It's not so good and it's a, uh, a hazard that we, we will have to deal with. But in general it took us from Stevenson's world of linear efficacy to what we in our group called collateral efficacy. What do I mean by that? Well, linear will be the ligand binds, it activates the G protein, receptor gets phosphorylated, et cetera, et cetera. It's bang, 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 bang. There was emerging evidence that, that a lot of drugs jumped Q. <clears throat> they didn't have to do all that. Uh, they would do part of it, but they wouldn't do it all. The most striking were the guys who, uh, bound to the receptor, did not activate it, but internalized it. So obviously this, this was different, and here it is. So we have a, it's, it's an analog of CCK, and it doesn't do anything, but it is very good internalizer of the receptor. The whole idea now, now that we had all, all these assays, you would run an assay just because you didn't see an efficacy didn't mean the compound doesn't have efficacy. It just means you had an assay that didn't show it. And efficacy became what Michel Bouvier called pluridimensional. Like an Escher print, you look at a compound different ways and you start to see different activities. Activities. And so what a compound emerged with is not only quantity of efficacy, but a quality. Now it, it, this, this guy could do this, 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 and this, and some other compound would do something else. So it went from a quantity to very much we could start thinking about quality. And there's some very interesting ways to express this. This is a way that Roger Summers does it, and I love this. He calls it the web of efficacy. So now he's, he's got his activities on axes, and in each compound you just make a shape, and guess what? Every compound makes a different shape. So this, this is telling us that as we drill down into efficacy, this is another one for opioids done recently. So, so now this is giving texture to these Compounds. Hopefully, it's going to help us choose the right compound for therapy. Let's return to the basics. The most simple model f 
for a compound producing response would be to enrich the single active state. So now we have a compound A and it drives this reaction to that species there. We see response. Now we have evidence that says, well, there's not just one active state. There is more than one active state. How many states? So we had emergence of models made three states, four states, five states, and so forth. Um, and so we were trying to define Occam's razor to uh, does it have four heads, three heads, and so forth. About this time, I became aware of work um, that freed us from that. It freed me and anyway. So I've really embraced it, and it has been extremely helpful to me. Uh, Ongun Onoran and Tommaso Costa published work where they see the protein as moving around. It's, it's got a lot of states. And so you have kind of this landscape where the protein can move around. And then you add hormone, ligand, and it forms a different landscape, totally freeing you from needing to know that it's one state, three states, whatever. And this was very useful, as I'll try to explain. So this, obviously, we kind of knew this anyway, but it very much treated receptors much more as uh, moving proteins. Their sole job is to move. So if you could freeze a system at any one instant, you would have different, slightly different shapes of the receptor protein. And these were referred to as a protein ensemble. And so one way to sort of think about this is the receptors rolling on what is called an energy landscape. It falls in a well. It's kind of happy with this state. It, it stays there a bit longer. And some states will have a function. So, so now if the protein resides in a well that turns on a G protein, that's what will happen. How do ligands change this? Well, they put the receptor in different regions of this landscape. And you can calculate out where you think a compound will put the receptor and so forth. The way the compounds do it is they give energy to certain states, not others. And this was, of course, well um, explained by Bergen this idea that a compound selects the state of the protein uh, by virtue of having a higher affinity for it. So if we could reduce these hundreds of states to just two squares and circles, <clears throat> and if that compound prefers circles, it will form that species before it forms this one. That species, in terms of energy, is different from this one, pulls it out of there, leaves the space, and drives the whole reaction towards more circles. So this is kind of our working model now of efficacy, and it's a well-known idea. So let's keep this in mind as we're trying to see how a compound steers the receptor into different energy wells. So you might think of the cell, if the height of those bars is the amount of time that a protein spends in a given state, it may see that kind of array. When you give a ligand, it's going to go in there, mess it up. It's going to choose some states over others, and this cell is now dealing with a different array, and that's going to give you response. <clears throat> um, I had the privilege to work with Honoran, and he, he had equations that would simply say, will this happen or not? Probability equations. And we made a test set of 5,200 compounds. We gave them random energies and found, of course, as you would expect, that affinity and efficacy are correlated. Um, saying that in a 
Sentence binding is not a passive process. So if you bind a compound, don't think you're just going to stick it onto the protein. The protein's behavior is going to change. So like this uh, quote, quote says, no matter how small the compound is and how large the protein is, the, the protein will perceive it. And so you're going to have a different system. Well, if you accept that, it also attacks something else that, when I was a student, this was sort of the view that all drugs, of course, stick to their targets, and so, some of them are special. They have efficacy and something happens. The more assays we have, the more happens, and you could almost defend this kind of statement. You say, ah, the drug's sticking to this kind of system. There's a very good chance that there's an efficacy in there somewhere. So for industry, what this might mean is if you run a screen, you, you have your hits, the point of gold at the end of the rainbow is take every single one of your hits and run it in every assay you possibly can. You might unearth some kind of efficacy that you did not realize. For us, it freed us from this linear idea. So you could say I have ensembles that activate G protein. Here's one that internalizes. I, I just made it up. But now you give a compound and it'll make its own on Ensemble. It'll give energy, and so now the whole system becomes this orange peak, which in this case there are elements that are common to the G protein peak and the internalization. So that confers the efficacy for the compound. So here's a compound that will signal and internalize. A different compound may do this. It may make it here, dimerize, internalize. So true or not, at least it's a model that describes what you see. So now this enables us, it frees us from this linear idea and you can see how compounds do these different things. So I'm going to ask you to accept, there was about 20 years at this point, evidence to support these statements. So that there are ligands that form different states, and some of these different states have different functions. If you accept this, then again in industry or in, in any drug discovery uh, effort, chemists can do magic for you. They can actually make compounds where you can choose the signaling, and this we all know, of course, as now biased compounds. So This o opened up an era of of can we make drugs better? We, we have a drug, it does good things, it also does things that aren't quite, quite as good. Can we lose those? And so forth. So this is the upside of that idea, that possibly if you can control this, you can uh, improve drugs. It also took screening from a, a situation of take what you get to de design your screen and get what you choose. So the whole idea, and we did this in our, our lab and many others, is you have a receptor there, it in interacts with ligands, it talks to a whole array of signaling proteins, and what's going to happen? You can have a natural compound like angiotensin and have a certain array of signaling, or you could give it TRV120 and just pick one of those, very striking, where you just knock out one of those pathways. And so this is a lot of what the therapeutics is aimed at. There are a lot of articles saying, if we could do, do this, we'll make a better drug, and a lot of this was centered on beta restin, and so this is now old, but um, there were ideas. If we could enhance beta restin signaling, we'd get a better drug. Remember, though, that we're going in there and we're messing up a natural balance. So if you talk to experts in the field like 
Luttrell, who does this, he's, he says he's got biased compounds that produce tumors. There, there's no guarantee that you'll always do a good, good thing. So you could make up a list as well that shows that if you activate beta restin in the wrong systems, you'll get bad things happening. So it's an emerging area. We are doing this and we're trying to see what works and what doesn't work. I'm often asked, is bias rare? And I'm likened to back when Costa and Hertz showed an inverse agonist. It was rare then. People said, ah, because they didn't have the assay to see it. And as they got the assay, all of a sudden everything's an inverse, or almost. I think that's probably what's going to happen with bias as well. When you think about it, what is bias? If two compounds are not biased with respect to each other, they're making an identical array, an identical ensemble. I think the chances of that are really small. So I think that many compounds will be biased. Countering that, however, yeah, different compounds will make different ensembles, but we only care about the ones that signal. So it may be that there will be compounds that don't change the ones that are critical. So the verdict is out still, whether it's rare or not. My prediction is it's probably not as rare as we think. So the field now has moved beyond in vitro, and now these compounds, as we get them, you put them in vivo, and that's very important, this idea of translation. And we got involved in scales, trying to give a scale that chemists can use to enhance bias. And so we returned to the time-honored model, uh, Jim Black's operational model. And you define an efficacy and an affinity for a pathway. So now you get tau, Ka, for G proteins, G1, G2, beta restin. And what we get is what we call in our lab transduction coefficients. It's log tau over Ka. And that becomes our number that we use to try to quantify how bias uh, any one compound is. Here's some work we did recently with Nushka Chammer. So you get these numbers, tau over Ka, you choose a reference. And this is for cyclic AMP, this is for ERK, and you refer everything to the same standard, and then you just subtract numbers. And what it's, it's quite easy to do, you get delta log tau over Ka, and bias becomes delta delta log tau over Ka. So this work generated this here. Those are not standard errors. Those are 95% limits. So this, this is clearly different. This compound, in this case, Fox321, I think, is 15.8-fold more prone to activate ERK than it is to activate G protein. So you can get these numbers, and hopefully chemists can use them to uh, in, enhance bias. So we get this number. We think it has meaning. But the real um, question is, it's, is it going to translate to in vivo conditions? And there are three general areas where this compound is going to go in and interfere with the natural system. The first, of course, is what everyone talks about. It's going to signal in different ways. The second is it's going to occupy the receptor and therefore probably interfere with natural signaling. And this can be the most important aspect of the biased compound. In the case of TRV120 in heart failure, it is. Really, okay, we're interested in that beta rest and response, but what we really care about is it knocks out the GQ vasoconstriction that you, you see. So if that's its main uh, activity there. And finally, an area that 
Not much work has been done in yet. I think it's not easy to do this work, but uh, the, the receptor gets phosphorylated in various ways that have been called barcoding, and bias compounds have been shown to change this. So now here we have opioids, and the receptor gets barcoded in different ways. And so we, we have yet to understand where this could lead. I'm going to finish up this uh, talk with returning to this problem of uh, not being able to predict. And I'm going to talk about whole cell bias. Because everything I told you holds up if you're within what is called the allosteric vector. If the signal escapes beyond that, there's all the rules change. So let me explain that. But it's going to lead to differences in bias just because of cell type. So the allosteric vector is when everything touches. You have the ligand binding to the receptor, binding to the G protein. There are numbers that control that, allosteric numbers of alpha and beta. So they're going to be system independent. It doesn't matter if that's in a hex cell, Cho cell, and those numbers will hold up. So if you're getting numbers from the allosteric vector, you're probably okay. What happens, however, if that signal escapes? So now we have a, a mixed signal, biased compound doing two things. And then the cell takes over. It says, I have a bigger pool for this response than I have for this one. Then that can completely change all these nice numbers. And you can model that. So you can say, I'm going to define an allosteric vector bias. And then I'm going to send it through a forcing function where I can say, here's a cell that really likes effector pool one versus here's one that likes. And you're, it'll change what you see. And this, this is seen well known. You take calcitonin receptor, uh, put it in a Cho cell, Cos cell. Those potency ratios are not the same. They're very different. Uh, we did some work years ago <coughs> where we simply enriched the hex cell with GS protein. And we were able to reverse relative potencies. Um, people are seeing this where they assay. You can do um, label free curves versus taking it from the cyclic AMP. And you can see again, those potency ratios are not the same. You can even use different ways to look at the end product, different label free assays, and you see those potencies are not the same. This, this really, um, well, it up, upsets students like these, these here. You can start asking the question, what do these bias numbers mean? And uh, so I'll return to an upside of this, but if, if you take this back to the discovery stage, um, yes, this, this is not meaningful if you expect a nice correspondence. I'm going to use this number to predict what I'll see. This, this of course, tells you it won't happen. But bias is very, very, very handy at the screening stage. So you run a screen, get your hits, and you move on. Bias is telling us the hits are not of equal quality. And very early on, you start to look at that. So in the old days, let's say, thinking of activity going that way, here, here's our, our hits. Uh, they, they seem to be most active. Let's put them in our animal model. Now, you can take a larger set of hits, put them in a different assay. I almost guarantee you, you will get a scattergram. You will not get a correspondence. And so what can I do here? Now I can at least give to my model 
compounds I know are different. They're doing different things. Here, I don't know that. I might be just choosing the same kind of compound. Here, I know that uh, this compound is doing more of one thing than another. And hopefully, this is going to increase the odds that we'll find a phenotype in an animal that we can link to that and chemists can enhance. So in the old days, strength of signal was pretty well everything. Now we have to think about it's not. Maybe it's the wrong signal. But also, we're trying to extend this in our lab by looking at this, um, in some ways, random uh, idea that cells can trump the allosteric factor bias. This, this is work done by Scott Peters. And um, he had a label free assay and he just ran his compounds dopamine 2, I think, uh, in two kinds of cells. And this is what he got. But the interesting thing was one compound jumped out at him. So now he, he has some. And so from this work you can make the statement that uh, this compound 636, for whatever reason, really likes uh, U2 cells more than the other cell. You could ask, you could say, who cares? But if I'd have told you, no, those cells have meaning, what if that was a normal cell versus cancer cell or a cell from a heart failure model? So what we're trying to do is use this approach to see if there are compounds that, for whatever reason, show up as specially active activity in a uh, different cell type that has meaning in some kind of disease. And, and we haven't taken that too far yet. I'd like to end by telling you about our allosteric work. So the receptor is not a switch, it's a computer computer. It takes different inputs and gives you different outputs. And it's also allosteric, as we all know, and it's very important to note it's two-headed. It, ligands can interact here, but the signaling proteins are equally important. So it's a two-way street. And everything the receptor does is allosteric. Um, so we'll, you can talk about this, which I won't. Let me talk about what we, we give a compound, we get a response agonism. That's an allosteric process. That's, that's just uh, allosteric. There we go. And the thing about allosteric is it's probe dependent. That is, that there's no rules. It's a change in shape of a protein. So you, you can have an allosteric compound and tracer one interacting with the protein and tracer two someplace else. There's no rule that says both sites should be changed in the same way. In fact, the rule is usually they aren't. So you can change tracer one binding. You may not affect tracer two at all. If I was to put those tracer sites into the cell, give them names, that's simply what we call bias. It's simply allosteric probe dependence. And all the rules, uh, models, equations that we use can be uh, applied. We are interested in quantifying allosteric effects in our, our lab. And the model we use is probably the simplest model you, you can have. So we take the Stockton Elert binding model, tack it on to the black left operational model. It's not, it's the obvious thing to do. And three groups in the same year published it because it, it is obvious. So we have now an, an equation that we can say, what does the allosteric ligand do to the effect of hormone A binding to the receptor to produce response? And we're looking for three numbers. One is the allosteric compound may have its own efficacy, so we have a tau. But most certainly, this is a permissive system. 
So the receptor may still interact with what it was interacting with before you added compound B. So you have to say, I might have modified affinity and the term doing that is alpha, or I might have modified the efficacy of the natural hormone uh, through a term called beta. So these are the numbers that we're trying to get at. And you can describe any change of curve with those models, but you get phenotypes emerging, and basically you have NAMs and PAMs. Negative allosteric compounds that inhibit either on their own or do it and give you some kind of direct response. So you can have that. Or positive, they potentiate response on their own or do so with, and a very interesting class of compounds that I can't talk about today, but we are very interested in panel E as, as well. So we spend some time looking at PAMs. What does a PAM do? It, it takes your curve to the hormone or the transmitter and either shifts it to the left. It may increase maximum if you can see it. So here we have a case of a 20-fold increase in affinity and a two-fold increase in efficacy. Interestingly enough, what we call agonism is simply a PAM effect on an ongoing reaction. So you can, uh, well known that receptors can form an active state on their own. And if you give it something to interact with, a G protein, you will get constitutive activity. So you could actually foresee a curve. You're actually adding this. And you generate what uh, people see as a constitutive activity curve. So that, that's the intrinsic efficacy, if you will, of the receptor. <clears throat> then you add a compound uh, A, hormone transmitter. It becomes a PAM of that natural reaction. So it's going to do this to that curve. And what we see now, that's if we could get a, a whole range of G protein concentrations. What we generally do is we choose one. We take a cell type and we just look at what happened at a given concentration of G protein. So here's what we see. We see the response go up, but really it's a reflection of that pro process there. So at various concentrations of G protein, you get various responses. All this, because allosteric compounds are permissive, you can't ignore what's going to happen to the natural signal. If you have an orthosteric inhibitor, ah, chances are you could wipe it out. You get it in its way and you won't see it. With an allosteric, you can't do that. You, you can get all kinds of things could happen that you have to be ready for. So the compound could, be, could inhibit response, it could potentiate it, but certainly what people are starting to see is it changes the quality of efficacy. So all these allosteric compounds now are modifying not only quantity of efficacy, but quality, which is an effect that, that we are interested in. So just like a compound can be biased when it pr pr produces response, NAMs and PAMs could induce bias onto the natural system. And this is already being seen. Here we have uh, NK2. Neurokinin A activates GQ and GS. When you give it the right allosteric compound, you get rid of the GS, but you don't do much to the GQ. So you've modified the, the uh, natural signal. Here's another case where that happens, where you just knock out beta restin. Um, We've done some work with GLP-1, and uh, I was really uh, impressed by the work of Cassandra Kuhl in Monash. She showed that when you have GLP-1 and you have that ligand, you can potentiate response. The GLP-1 does a lot of 
things in a cell, but if you take a PAM like Novo 2, you will only potentiate cyclic AMP. You won't touch the other responses. So you have changed the, uh, the quality of your efficacy. So we were interested in some scale too that we could use, that we could show a chemist, can, can you enhance this or not? And we simply return to the bias model again. So you have a compound, um, well, you have a hormone curve. That's this, this guy here. And you give it a PAM. So you go from this curve to, to this. What are those, those curves? Well, the normal control curve you can define by the uh, operational model. And the curve in the presence of the allosteric compound is the same thing, but now efficacy is modified by the term beta and affinity is modified by the term alpha. So you can just do the same thing you did with bias, refer to a uh, standard, but in this case, the standard is the same compound, just in the presence and absence of your allosteric compound. So you can get a number delta uh, tau over Ka, which becomes actually log of the alpha beta term. You do that pathway one, you do that in pathway two, and the delta delta becomes log, difference in log alpha beta. This should be a, an allosteric vector number that should hold up, and so 10 to the power of that is bias. So we're exploring this. There is published work. Here, here's one, there's not much, it's not very dramatic, um, but here we have a compound that uh, potentiates calcium effects and ERK effects. It produces very slight bias towards calcium. It does a bit more to calcium than it does uh, to the ERK. Um, NAMS, here's one that does a bit more. This is work from Arthur's group, um, where you're seeing a compound that's 37 times it inhibits one pathway more than the other. So where I'm ending this is we're, with all these assays and ideas, we're increasing our checklist for what are we interested in when we do a screen, run a compound, run a binding assay, we're interested in affinity and selectivity. Is it allosteric, orthosteric? Now we should be thinking about other stuff. Does the compound have some hidden efficacy? If it's allosteric, certainly it's going to induce bias. Uh, if your compound produces response, those are the old question. Now, again, other efficacies? Is it bias? No one's doing much in that yet. But these are now increasing ways we can uh, look at compounds and choose them. Uh, and finally, PAMs, where um, we are interested in, do, do, do these induce bias? So where this is heading is, if you think about the, the heaven and hell of Alice Deary, uh heaven, drugs stabilize different states. This, this should give us texture. This should give us different efficacies. The hell is drugs make stable different states because this can also bring with it difficult, I, I say challenges, because what it in essence does is makes you do more assays. But nothing he can't handle. So a lot of time in industry we, we spent, uh, are we looking at the right therapeutically uh, useful efficacy? This, this, this is old now, but it, it illustrates point. These are the drugs that entered phase one, shown in blue. With year, it's going up. We're making more drugs. The ones in red work. They're the ones that entered phase three, and that's not going up. 
And this space is the worst space you could have. It's the one that's causing layoffs, mergers, and so forth. It's expensive. These are programs probably that did everything right. They said, this is what we want. They did their program. They got what they wanted and found it wasn't therapeutic. So we need ways in which we could get rid of that problem. And I would, on a positive note, say that bias and all these ideas hopefully are going to help us hone compounds towards being more tuned into what is therapeutic in terms of efficacy. And the key person there is the pharmacologist. That, that's where pharmacology plays a role. So I've gone on long enough. Um, a lot of this work was done at GSK, uh, and I work with Arthur in Monash um, and Corning, and I now work with Brian Roth. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.